Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now it's good to see you here in the auditorium in the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate your presence. We have another spring day, looks like today. It's a good day to be in God's house. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour. I hope that you'll enjoy the hour coming up and you'll get on your phone and call others, have them to tune in. Now we have a list of our cassette tape. Now tape number today will be number 159. Tape number 159 is the tape today, both music and message. You can write and get these tape by sending in a gift of $3 for each tape. Maybe many of you received a tape recorder for Christmas. I hope you did and be getting some of these tape and listening to them and letting others do likewise. Now you can write in and get these tape. If you'd like to have a list of our cassette tape, just write in and request it. We'd gladly send you a list. I do have some 158 tapes listed. I have maybe 100 more that's not listed. I'd be delighted to send you a list of about 158 of our tape if you write in and request them. You might see some on the list that you'd like to have that could be an inspiration to you. Now, if you have your Bible today, I want you to turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 6. It's page 718 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. Isaiah chapter 6. Now, as a man and his wife one time, or elderly couple, they went to church and people noticed them sitting there holding hands. Somebody sitting behind them said, you know, that's most certainly a lovely couple up in years like that and they sat down hold hands the lady turned and looked back and said uh, it's not love said I'm just holding his hand to keep him from popping his knuckles during the church and so sometimes you might get food you know when you see things happening and people doing things and so she didn't want him to be cracking his knuckles while the preacher's preaching so they just held hands during the service well that's a good way I guess to prevent that from happening Isaiah chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. In the year that King Azariah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, and each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post, the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed that understand not, and see ye indeed but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered unto the cities, Be without inhabitants, and the house without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, that be a great forsaken in the midst of the land. Now that's reading from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 12. I'm going to take a phrase out of the first verse and use that today as my title. In the year. Notice the first three words. In the year. In the year. We'll soon be entering into a new year. Now I want you to keep that phrase in mind. In the year. Now this will be tape number 159. I failed to give my mailing address. Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. If you'd like to have this tape and the singing, you write in and get it next week. We'd be glad to send it to you in appreciation for your support to this ministry of a $3 gift for the tape. 
in the year. Now in the year coming up, 1985, that year is going to elevate some few people to heaven. That year is going to sink millions into hell. That's happening every year. As the years go by, 1984 exalted some few to heaven and it sunk millions into hell. The same thing is going to happen in 1985. In 1985, there'll be multitudes who will have that year number on their Bible marker, on their tombstone, because there'll be some people that's listening to me right now that'll die during 1985. We don't know who they are. Could be me, could be you. We just don't know who they are, but there's some people that's now listening to the sound of my voice that'll be in the grave if Jesus tears his coming one year from now. Now what I want to encourage you to do is to stay busy for God during the coming year. Who knows the Lord may come in 1985. And who knows God may call you home in 1985. And the Bible said in the year. Now it's in the year that King Uzziah died that Isaiah saw the Lord. I don't know why he hadn't seen the Lord before then, but he saw him in the year that King Uzziah died. Maybe he'd seen him before, I don't know. But there's one thing certain, he saw the Lord in the year that King Uzziah died. You never did like to see things happen like that to cause people to turn to God, but it does many times. A lot of times people never touched, they never turn to God until somebody in the family dies. Then they begin to think about eternity. You hate to see a child uh, a mother or dad or brother or sister taken out of the family to get the unbelievers to begin to think about eternity. But that happens. Many years ago in the city of Greenville, South Carolina, as a young Christian, I was doing some uh, personal work, knocking on a few doors one afternoon. I approached this home. I knocked on the door. A beautiful young lady came to the door, young mother. I introduced myself and I told her who I was. And I was out working for the Lord and invited her to the church and to the Lord. She said she was not saved. And uh, when I got ready to leave, I said to her, I said, I live down the way here. And if you ever need me about anything, I want you to feel free to call on me if I can help you in any manner. She thanked me very kindly and closed the door and went back in the house and I went on my way. It wasn't very long after that until one morning real early. Someone knocked on my door. I went to the door and there stood this lady weeping and a husband. I invited them in. There was about five of them. And his mother and dad, and I believe his sister, and the man and the wife. I invited them into our living room. And I said, let's pray about this. But first of all, I want to know if you would like to get right with God. You can't pray until you get right with God. And they said, we surely would, preacher, we'd like to get right with God. Now the little baby died. Now I don't know why God took the child, but God took the baby. But these five people, mother and dad, grandfather and grandmother, and the man's sister, best I can recall, all three got saved. And they served the Lord. The man and his wife came and joined the Westview Baptist Church and, and for a number of years, and far as I know, still serving God. Now that baby's death brought about those people getting right with God. In the year that that baby died, they got right with God. In fact, within the day. And so in that year, when King Isaiah died, Isaiah saw the Lord. Now a lot of people are never, never moved, never touched until they follow a little body to the graveyard, a follow mother and dad or brother or sister, wife or husband to the cemetery. Now that's bad. You need to come to know God before something like that happens. Because you never know when God may speak. You never know when it may happen. In the year King Azariah died, I saw the Lord. In the year. In the year. Keep that in mind. Many years ago, there were two young men attending a seminary in one of the northern states, attending college rather. They were good friends and they both graduated from college. One young man surrendered for the ministry. The other young man moved out west and bought a ranch and started uh, 
a huge ranch out west and began to make good money and prosper. The man finished the seminary, took his first church, and my had a battle trying to pastor his first church. He became so discouraged many times. Sometimes it felt like just giving up and not trying anymore, just let the people go on their way and let sinners die and go to hell. But he knew he couldn't very well do that. And he almost had a nervous breakdown. He happened to think about his friend out west. He said, I'm going in that direction anyway. Now I'm going to stop by and see my friend and maybe stay with him a day or two. I haven't seen him since our college days. So he wrote his friend and told him, said, I'll be out by your way. I'm going on out into California and I'll stop by your ranch and pay you a visit. I'll be there on the train at a certain day and a certain hour. His friend wrote him back and said, we'll be waiting for you. This young preacher boarded the train and headed west and came to this little town. The train stopped at the depot and there, sure enough, he saw his friend. He stepped off the train and they got into a new station wagon and the road many miles down a beautiful road and came to a beautiful ranch. That night he slept in a beautiful bed there in a beautiful ranch home. The next morning when he got up to go downstairs, they were cooking bacon down there on the grill. It smelled so good. They had a wonderful breakfast. And then his friend said, uh, I want you to go, go to ride with me. And they went out and they saddled up the horses and there they mounted two beautiful horses and they started toward a little hill out across the range. But there was a little girl on a little pinto. His little daughter, she was riding along singing like a little magpie. She rode along with her dad and this preacher. They rode on to a beautiful hill. They arrived at the top of that hill. And uh, this man that owned the ranch took off his sombrero and there waved it to the east, the west, the north, the south, and this beautiful hill. He said, friend, I'll have you to know that in every direction I wave this hat. Everything you see in that direction belongs to me. I've really been blessed out here. Everything I've touched seemed to prosper. This preacher was somewhat uh, down and out because he'd had it so rough. They went back to the ranch and he aborted the train and went on out west, out into California. But he promised his friend, he said, I'll stop by to see you as I come back through and maybe it's still the night. He said, I want you to do so. He spent his time out west and then he boarded the train and started back east and stopped by to see his friend again. He met him there at the depot and they got on, they boarded the beautiful station wagon, they rode back to the ranch. He spent the night in the same bed. He got up the next morning. There he, heard, he smelled the bacon cooking on the grill. They had a wonderful breakfast. They went out, they saddled their horses, they rode in the same direction toward the little hill, the most beautiful spot on the ranch. And then they rode on and came to the top of the hill, but there's one thing like him. The little pinto and the little girl was along. When they came to the top of that hill, there they stopped and this man took off his sombrero. There he waded a little grave with beautiful flowers on it. He said, there lay my little daughter. She passed away since you left here, preacher. But he said, all these things that you see in every direction, he said, I'd gladly give them if I just had that precious daughter back. He was greatly disturbed. And there the man got right with God. God had to take that little daughter, precious, beautiful little daughter, before that man would give God the glory and get his heart right with God. In the end that King Isaiah died, Isaiah saw the Lord. What's it going to take to get you to see God? There's some of you out there in the radio list, notice you haven't been to church this whole year. 1984 has passed, you haven't darkened the door of the house of God. Maybe you got your name on a church roll somewhere, but you haven't attended your church. You haven't read your Bible. You know not God. What's it going to take to get you right with God? In the year that King Isaiah died, in that year, in that year, he saw the Lord. What's it going to take? In 1985, will God have to move in and take some member of your family out of your home, and you have to follow that love under cemetery before you'll see God? In the year King Azara died, Isaiah saw the Lord. I hope that won't be the case. I hope you'll think about it and get right with God before God moves in and touches some member of your family to put you to thinking, to shake you up, to get your mind on God, to let you know what you ought to do. You ought to make a New Year's resolution. Next Sunday is the first Sunday of the New Year. You ought to determine by the help and grace of God that you'll be in God's house, that you'll get right with God if you're not right with the Lord. And you be faithful in serving God because you don't have much longer to live. We're moving on now year by year and they move so quickly. 
And somebody's going to be elevated to heaven. And somebody's going to seek in the hell this coming year. Where will you go if God calls you? In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord. I hope someone won't have to die before you can see the Lord. Many years ago, there's a great preacher in North Carolina. In Shelby, North Carolina, he was called Daddy Brock. He was a powerful preacher. But as a young man, God called him to preach. He said, no, I won't do it. He rebelled against God. He refused to preach. He refused to obey God. Knowing God had called him to preach, but he wouldn't preach. He had a beautiful 11-year-old daughter. She was a little doll. She died suddenly. They carried that little 11-year-old girl out to the grave. They placed the little body down in the cool earth. They put the dirt back upon her, her body. They placed those flowers upon that dirt. This young preacher at that time fell down on his knees, threw his hands upon those flowers on top of that grave. He said, oh God, I know why. I know why my baby daughter is under those sods. You called me to preach years ago, Lord, and I didn't do it. I know why, God, but I promise you, Lord, from this day on, I'll do what you call me to do. And that man surrendered to you to preach the gospel. He said, I could have preached and had my little daughter with me. But now I'm going to preach without her, but Lord, I'll preach. That man preached until his dying day, became known as Daddy Brock, and stirred people all over that country preaching the gospel. But God had to pick from his home that little 11-year-old daughter to get that man to do what God wanted him to do. In the year King Azariah died, I saw the Lord. In that year, I saw the Lord. What year is God going to knock on your door? God's going to speak to you. God's going to touch somebody in your family. Will it be 1985? It may. If I were you, I'd do something about it before that year even got here. Now he saw the Lord when, I, when King Azariah died. Then in verse 4, he saw something else. He saw the power of God. The post and the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Not only you need to see God by faith and know God by faith, as a born-again believer, but you need the power of God. This preacher needs power with God. You need power with God. Every Christian needs power with God. There is power for use in God's work. We're living a firecracker life in an atomic age. We need power with God Almighty. Dwight L. Moody preached for a number of years, saw little results. One day walking down the street in New York City while he's making up some money, where his uh, property had been burned and a whole block burned in Chicago by the great Chicago fire. He was trying to get a little money to help the people that were homeless. Walking down that street many times, he had prayed for power. He said, oh God, I want power. I need power to do the job. While walking down the street there in New York, the power of the Holy Spirit of God came upon him. He felt God's presence. He began to praise the Lord. Tears trickled down his cheeks and he saw an old empty building there beside the street and he turned and ran into that building praising God, shouting the victory. And he said, God, I can't take you anymore. Stay your hand. Thank you, God, for your power. After that, he said, I'd rather die. I'd rather be buried than to try to serve God like I was serving him without his power. He said, I'm so glad that God gave me the power to do the job. Now, that power is not for preachers only. That power is not for deacons and teachers only. Holy Ghost power is for every born-again believer. Amen. That is your divine birthright. The Bible says, be ye filled with the Spirit. And when you're filled with God's Spirit, you're going to see things move by the hand of God as you serve the Lord. I don't care what it is. It may be on your job. Things may be different. It may be in your home. Things may be different. And to be certain, it'll be different in your life. It'll be different in your church when you feel with the power of God. That is your divine birthright. That comes apart from the indwelling Spirit of God when you're saved. The power of God is the controlling of the Spirit of God. That's what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit is that you're completely controlled by the Spirit of God. When you're controlled by the Spirit of God, you won't sit at home on Wednesday night knowing your pastor is trying to teach the Word of God and need, you need to be there to be fed. You'll be in the house of God. When you're controlled by the Spirit of God, you won't be sitting at home on Sunday night when you know you ought to be in God's house. 
You won't be sitting at home doing revival meetings when you're controlled by the Spirit of God. You'll be hungry. You'll be anxious to get in on the things of God. You'll be in the Sunday school. You'll do everything you can to get more of God's Word and to serve the Lord because 1985 may be the marker on your grave. And you'll be glad you did ere you come to that particular time. Now the Bible said the post moved at the power of God. If you want the post to move, it can move. And it will move when you feel with God's power. That obstacle in your home. That obstacle on your job. That obstacle in your community. It can move by the power of God when you feel with the Holy Ghost. It will be like a bulldozer plying through. You can make it if you feel with the power of God. God promises that in the Bible. Then number three, in verse five, he said, Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because of men of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of people unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now this man here, Isaiah, saw himself in bad shape. That is, the closer he got to God, the more he saw his need of getting closer. Now the closer you get to the mirror and brighter the light, the more you're going to see your need of doing things for God. You can stand a good way from a mirror and look at yourself in the mirror. You might have a dirty face and not realize it. But you get up close to that mirror, up real close to God, and you're going to see yourself in the mirror of God's Word. And you're going to see a need for cleansing. Whenever you have an invitation for people to rededicate their lives to God, to have a new cleansing, new filling, you know who are the first ones to the altar? Those are closest to God. You know who stands back and maybe never move forward? Those are furthest away from God. The closer you get to the Lord, the more you're going to see your need of getting just a little bit closer. And when you get real close to Jesus, you're going to feel like you're the most unclean person that ever lived. You're going to feel like you need to get closer more than anybody else that's living. You won't be pointing out your brother or your sister and say they need to get closer. You'll be looking at yourself and say, I need to get closer. You'll be concerned about yourself getting closer to God. Now the Bible said he lived, he saw unclean lips. He said, woe is me if I'm undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. Now he didn't see that until the year King Isaiah died and he saw the Lord. And then he saw his need of having a new cleansing by the power of God Almighty. We need, as it were, our feet washed. You remember one occasion whenever Simon Peter was arguing with the Lord about washing his feet and Jesus said, Now, Simon, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And Simon Peter said, Lord, don't just wash my feet, but just wash me all over. If that's what it takes, wash me all over. Jesus said, You don't need to be washed all over. You're already saved, you just need your feet washed. Now, I don't believe that's an ordinance. I don't believe in foot washing today in the churches as an ordinance. But it's a symbolic of getting closer to God and getting cleansed of Christ anew. Not salvation, but a new cleansing by the blood of Jesus Christ. Then let's move on to another thought in verse 7. And he laid it upon my mouth. That is, he's had a coal of fire in verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues of all the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips. Thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Now here, when this man saw his need, then he got a new cleansing. The seraphim took off the altar, a coal of fire, and touched his lips. You're not going to get a new cleansing and a closer walk with God until you see your need. You'll never be filled with the Spirit of God until you're thirsty to do so. Jesus said, Him that thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. You'll never get close to God if you have a desire to do so. You must have that desire. And if you have that desire, then, beloved, you can get closer to God. Like the little preacher's boy. The pastor would go into the study, and then he would, when he opened the door to leave, he, there lay his little boy down at the door. His ear right at the door, at the bottom of the door. And his daddy said, Son, what in the world are you doing there on the floor like that? He said, Daddy, I, I just like to be close to you and Daddy. I just love to hear you pray. Now that was a little boy that left to hear his daddy pray and he wanted to be close to his daddy. And whenever you begin to draw closer to God, you feel like you can't get close enough. You just want to keep moving on and God will cleanse those lips. Then in verse 8, 
Number five, he says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Now you can't hear God if your ears fill with the airwax of this world. So many church members today, bless your heart, they go home and during the week they sit there and they turn that TV on and they fill their ears with the airwax of this world and they can't hear God. You can't hear God if you're going to keep your ears filled with the trash and junk that come on radio and TV many times when you ought to be reading your Bible and listening to God. You can get your ears so full of the airwax of this world, you can't hear God. And you'll be walking seemingly a thousand miles away and not realize it. Now you've got to get your ears cleaned out. Get your ears cleaned out by the power of God and not fill with the airwax of this world. So many church members today have their ears filled with the airwax of this world. I know TV can be used for good, it can be used for bad. I'm not telling you to throw away your TV set if you want to do that, that's your business. I'm telling you, you need to try to control the thing. It's in your home like your radio, your automobile. It can be used for good if you're allowed to be used for good. Or it can be used for evil. And that's one thing that's wrecked and hurts so many of my church today spiritually is that TV set. It's been one of the biggest curses ever come to America in regard to God's people and in regard to spirituality. It can be enlightening. It can be educational. If it's used right, you can use it for good. But too many people use it for evil. They let their youngins, their children sit there and fill their ears with that junk and violence and scenes on TV and never one time condemn any of it. Uh, try to cut the thing off when certain programs are on their children don't need to see. And then they wonder why they care nothing about Sunday school. Then they wonder why they care nothing about going to church. And, and they wonder why they love the evil of the world more than the things of God. They fill their ears, they wax the world through that TV channel or some uh, uh, junk rock and roll uh, radio program or something of that type. And they have not in thousand miles of God. He said, I heard the voice. You can't hear God's voice if your ears fill with airwax of this word. You've got to get them cleaned out. Then number six, he said, here am I, send me. Now Isaiah, when he had seen the Lord, got straightened out with God. He wanted to go. He said, Lord, send me. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll do anything, Lord, you want me to do. I'll go, God. I'll go. Here am I, send me. He was ready. I wonder how many today that's listening to me. In this auditorium, out in the radio listed audience, you could say, Lord, here am I, use me in 1985. Would you be willing to say that? Lord, use me in 1985. Here am I, Lord, I want you to use me. Would you be willing to do that? Would you be willing to say that? If you did, you'd be so glad you did, ere you come to the end of life's journey. Here am I, Lord, send me, he said. He was willing to go. Then we come to thought number seven, and that's found in verse 11. It said, then said our Lord, how long? How long, dear Lord, do you want me to go? You want me to go for a short period of time? You want me to go just for a week or two? Lord, how long do you want me to work for you? How long, God, must I go? God said, Isaiah, I want you to go until there's not a man left to tell about Jesus. Out here in this world today, we have more people on the face of the earth than's ever been known before. The world is loaded, loaded with people. Most of them going to hell. 90% of them on the road to hell. And yet there's so many people that need the gospel and so few trying to get the word of God out. These old Russellites that call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses, which they're not Jehovah's Witnesses, Satan's Witnesses, Relephites and Russellites and Noahelites, They'll trot around with a little satchel and that poison literature. They're deceived by the devil on the road to hell. No, not God. And yet they'll trot around from house to house and try to give out that poison literature. And we want to talk to you about the Battle of Armageddon. And they don't know the Old Testament from the New when it comes to writing about the word of truth. And they put the average child of God to shame. They're a bunch of Satan's witnesses. They're the devil's witnesses. And yet they'll put the child of God to shame. They go around with a poison doctrine. And here you have the truth as a child of God. And never one time try to give out a track or try to witness or try to help anybody at God. And these old no hellites will walk around on Saturday or on Christmas Day or any other time. And there they'll try to give out that poison literature. 
and they'll try to talk to you about the battle of Armageddon or something like that to try to get your attention. And they don't know any more about God than the cow knows when Sunday comes. In fact, if the dog out the house knows more about Sunday than they do. And beloved, listen to me. They know nothing about God. They're Satan's witnesses. They're without God. They're lost, blind leaders of the blind going to hell they don't believe in. And yet you people have the truth. Many of you sitting out there, you have the truth and never, never offer to do anything about it. In the year that King Azara died, I saw the Lord. In the year, in the year, 1985, in the year. What does that hold for us? In the year. The greatest shock of your life may come in 1985. The greatest shock of my life may come. The greatest blessings may come. The greatest tragedy may come. In the year that King Azara died, he saw the Lord. Is somebody going to have to die? You out there in the radio listener, is somebody going to have to die in your home before you'll ever get right with God and go to God's house? Is that going to happen? In the year that King Azara died, I saw the Lord. Let's stand our feet. Dear Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll take the message and that you use it to thy glory. May thy name be honored. May Jesus be glorified. Our Father, help us to see the Lord by faith. May somebody in the radio listen to see the Lord by faith. Dear God, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll use this message today to the glory of God. In Christ's name I ask it. Amen. Now Debbie is playing for us on the organ. She plays, if you're in this building, if God has spoken to you today about anything, and you feel that you need to come down here and let me help you to Christ, back to God, or anyway. If God has spoken to you, I've given you the message. Now it's up to you to respond to the invitation. How about it?